can try. Hey, we all are here, finally. And we are live. Well, thank you so much, guys, for joining us. I think we are live now. Uh, Right. And I also welcome everyone like who has joined or like who's just listening to us right now. Um, happy World Forest Day first. And uh, today we have with us Eric, Claudia and Vijay. Uh, I'll have a brief, uh, I'll just introduce them uh, in some time. But uh, let me just tell you uh, about like today's day and why we are here, right? Um, so Roosevelt called the lungs, this particular uh, thing as lungs of the earth, and many artists and poets and painters were inspired by them. A um, lot of people have been uh, involved and backed an initiative uh, to, uh, you know, save them, right? It's not just the celebrities or uh, who have like a very strong connection towards them, uh, it's it's all of us. We all do. Uh, a, just a simple walk in the woods can calm and invigorate our senses, and it just relaxes at a different level. Um, in fact, the forests are so crucial to the future of our planet that the UN declared uh, March 21st to be an international day of forests. For many years now, this amazing global celebration has been creating awareness all over the world about their importance. And they are one of the greatest natural treasure that we must preserve and protect. So today we are here to celebrate that treasure and soundscape event, will, which basically means a collection of sounds that uh, of a landscape will introduce you and help you to explore the sonics of this green world. Right. So first we have Eric, um, who is a Chicago based artist, uh, serves as a president and a board chair of the World Listening Project and a founder and a co-chair of the Midwest Society for Acoustic Ecology and president of the World Forum of Acoustic Ecology as well. So he's an adjunct professor in the Department of Sound at the, uh, at the School of Art Institute of Chicago as a performer and a sound designer. Eric has created sound with Chicago-based uh, theater groups. And he also performs internationally and uh, using a springboard, a self-built instrument uh, made in 1994 and often presents the acoustic ecology to new audience. Thank you so much for joining us today, Eric. And uh, right now, I think uh, it's your, it's all yours. I think you just go ahead and um, just talk about your World Listening Project. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, and, and thank you for inviting me to, to join you today and, and talk about our work. Hopefully you're able to hear me without any trouble, uh, but if you're having a, a problem, let me know right now so we can adjust things a little bit. But um, if we're, all, we're doing okay, uh, yeah. Yeah, thumbs up. That's great. Yeah. So um, I think one thing about uh, understanding the soundscape uh, that we are in uh, at all times and uh, uh, and how it uh, is a, a shared resource is also being aware that um, 
because I can hear doesn't mean you can. And so uh, it's, it's always easy to make some assumptions about what everyone else hears when, and those can be quite different from what we actually experience. And so that sort of gets to the nature of our own humanity in, in the world in terms of how our, our, our thinking and our listening uh, can be highly uh, complex and individual, but at the same time, very um, social. So, um, uh, so and, and that is a, an integral part to um, our understanding of uh, the role of listening, sound, and our environment, which is a, a set of interrelated and dynamically changing from moment to moment um, uh, quality or characteristic or phenomena that is um, core to the definition of a soundscape. Uh, I'll touch on again briefly. So what I was hoping to talk about um, with you for this brief time together is um, um, uh, my work with uh, World Listening Project, and I titled this talk, The Unquiet Earth. So um, um, that happens to be the theme of World Listening Day, an annual event that takes place um, initiated by the World Listening Project, a nonprofit organization that formed in Chicago back in 2002. And uh, if you may, I'll try to do a, a screen share to, just to show you that, because um, our existence is mostly in the form of a, an online presence. And so we try to be a world, uh, um, um, focused organization, uh, thanks to the internet. So uh, if you bear with me for a second, I'll try to do my screen share here and navigate to the uh, uh, the window for World Listening Day 2021. Uh, and here we go. So I hope you can see that uh, right now, uh, but still uh, be able to hear me. So um, what I would like to talk about is, um, first of all, my own background is um, as a, um, a sound artist, you might say. Uh, I, I started off as a visual artist. I was also uh, a drummer and I learned to play drums in a drumming bugle corps as a hobby when I was a, a teenager. And so um, that was a very, social uh, activity, uh, a, a competitive activity, uh, working with uh, the visual and the audio together. Um, and my work was also influenced by um, popular music as much as uh, experimental, experimental avant-garde music. And uh, all of those came together when I learned about the work of John Cage, uh, an American co composer whom you may be familiar with. Uh, he's much more uh, known uh, than in those days when I was a student back in the 70s. So, um, so um, what's notable about John Cage's work was um, his merging of art and life and uh, accepting all sounds as a part of uh, the musical experience, including noise and silence. So um, there's much more to be said about describing his work, but that's just a, a basic entry point uh, into um, uh, the artistic approach to sound and the sound environment. So um, what I could say is that um, I've also just finished writing about my own work and, and my own belief in the power and the need for collective efforts by people. And this seems critically important to me in order to change the destructive uh, direction that um, we're going in uh, when it concerns uh, uh, forest habitats uh, as much as the, the urban environment. Um, and so uh, the destruction of the natural world through extraction by colonialism and capitalism is really, um, something that has been going on for centuries now, but we're reaching a critical moment in our, in our uh, world. Um, 
And I, I believe that the, the Western Eurocentric notion of nature based on a dualism that falsely imagines humanity as separate from nature leads to these problems that we find ourselves in today um, with grave consequences for the earth. So as an artist interested in sound, I'd like to be able to uh, bring people together and make a change and rethink the way we're approaching the earth and our, 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 our membership in a, uh, a global community that includes the humans and non-human actors in, in producing and uh, regenerating our lives. So um, we seek to make art and draw attention to what we call the soundscape. Um, our soundscape is an environment. The sounds we are in right now, the sounds that are coming and going all the time, but also the way that this environment is perceived and understood by the, the individual or by a society. And that's basically a definition of soundscape as it was developed by R. Murray Schaefer and the World Soundscape Project in the early 1970s. Uh, Murray Schaefer is a renowned Canadian composer, music educator, and author who established this radically new and interdisciplinary er effort to understand the complex interrelationships between humans and their environment through sound. With a team of researchers, mostly of, most of them were composers, he, he led the World Listening Project, and they developed the fundamental concepts and practices of acoustic ecology. And so today I've been involved, well, going on now since the early 90s in this field of work. And it involves the scientific, the social, and the aesthetic uh, concerns around our sound environment. So it's an opportunity for creative work as much as it is for scientific study and activism. So with that, um, we have a number of artists who are concerned and uh, involved in acoustic ecology. Uh, among the influences uh, I've had are um, Hildegard Westerkamp, a Vancouver-based ecologist and soundscape composer who worked with Murray Schaefer in the World Soundscape Project and continues this to this day in <clears throat> in, uh, excuse me, in um, leading sound walks, creating soundscape compositions, and is, is sort of uh, served as a, uh, an inspiration to many artists. Uh, I highly recommend listening to some of her soundscape compositions such as Beneath the Forest Floor, which is very apropos for today's theme and the occasion of World Forest Day. It was created in 1992. Um, also, Cricket Voice, created in 1987, and Kit Speech Soundwalk in 1989. Uh, these are exemplary works of music and uh, composition made from the sounds of the real world, uh, manipulated through studio techniques, through audio technology, to create a, a musical experience that reflects on our relationship with the world at large and its natural environments. So um, when we talk about recording sounds in natural soundscapes, um, I think of Bernie Krause, who is a, a musician and later became a bioacoustician in the uh, 70s and for more than 40 years has been recording world soundscapes um, um, and archiving them, um, consulting, and also creating creative works, artistic works on this scientific approach to the sound environment. Um, uh, Bernie Krause theorized different aspects of sound, including uh, definitions of the different features of a, a soundscape, such as anthropophony and biophony, uh, geophony to uh, distinguish between the different uh, phenomena and processes that are part of the soundscape. So 
Uh, Bernie Krause was also a member of the board of directors for the World Soundscape uh, Project, or World Listening Project, I mean, um, the organization that I helped found in 2008 with a group of artists here in Chicago. So, um, um, so we were inspired to start the World Listening Project in uh, that year, and we reached out to R. Murray Schaefer about what we were interested in. Uh, and some of those activities included making uh, sound maps uh, online using um, web technologies to play back sounds so you can explore those. And um, there are quite a few uh, global sound maps uh, available now, uh, have been for more than 10 years that you can explore sounds of the world um, through that interface, that technological interface. And um, so we contacted R. Murray Schaefer and asked if we could um, get his participation or find out what he thought about that. And uh, Murray uh, replied that, um, and I'll quote what he, he wrote in response, is that, the recordist has an obligation to know what is being recorded and to index it carefully. We did this with the recordings we made to accompany the Vancouver soundscape. And I'm glad we did because locating specific sounds on those recordings and knowing something of their history makes them much more valuable than a lot of the recordings made since then. He goes on to say, Sometimes students will come to me with recordings and want me to listen to the remarkable fidelity. What kind of frogs are on that recording, I ask. They don't know, but they should know. Otherwise their document, which may have some aesthetic value, has no social value or, or historical value. But to produce a re historical recording of value takes time and patience. Many recordists are merely tourists in the soundscape, unfortunately. And so with that, Murray suggested, we come to the meeting of the World Forum for Acoustic Ecology in Mexico City, taking place in March, 2009. That was 12 years ago this week. And at that event, um, I actually went there in Mexico City and the Mexican Forum for Acoustic Ecology had just formed, and their conference was titled Sound Megalopolis, Cultural Identity and Sounds in Danger of Extinction. So um, that was an important event um, that changed my life because I had uh, met the uh, founding members of the World Forum for Acoustic Ecology back in 1993. Um, in Canada and uh, participated in the founding conference of that organization. And so um, I was um, 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 pursuing my own career as a sound artist, performing with the springboard, working, uh, making uh, sound design for theater, which was kind of a, you know, uh, a particular uh, environmental sound uh, um, uh, production of its own uh, for the, the years that uh, um, followed the founding of the World Forum for Acoustic Ecology. And so it was in 2008 and 2009 that I was reconnecting with the World Forum and uh, meeting some of the, the early founders and then a whole group of new um, artists and researchers that were a part of this event and extending my friendships and relationships from uh, Canada and the US and in Europe and with those that are in Mexico. And I'm really happy to say that um, our, our, our members in um, Mexico are starting their own group. Uh, the Mexican Forum went through uh, a number of changes and uh, we have an active group that gave a, a, a brilliant international conference back in um, uh, December of just last year. <clears throat> and so um, that was a moving event. Um, I was able to connect with um, 
the um, the author and MIT professor emeritus Barry Blesser, who gave a, a keynote presentation uh, and said uh, a few things that have stuck with me uh, very much uh, since then in terms of the value of sound and ecology. And he put it just in very simple terms. And he said, sounds tell us where we are. And, and so a soundscape is very much about um, your sense of place. Um, you may not be aware of it from moment to moment, but it's, it's always there. Um, the sounds we make, whether we're aware of them or not, are always reflecting through the rooms, through the spaces that we move in, and are always helping to locate us. The creative sense of place, which might also be a sense of belonging, but also to uh, inform how we move through those spaces. And those movements produce sounds themselves, and those sounds transmit through the soundscape and heard by others, other people, other animals, other creatures. And so if we want to study the forest ecology or the urban ecology, our role in creating the soundscape, again, whether we we're aware of it or not, is always active. And uh, especially if we're in an environment uh, less dominated by human activities um, and other where other species are active, once we as a human enter into that space, it's important to know that as long as we're moving, we're announcing our presence. And so uh, a lot of scientists uh, and researchers are now placing remote recording devices in the forest to gather data about the other creatures there so that the human presence is minimized. And so that we can listen in to the soundscape in uh, a, a less invasive way and disturb the activities and the life cycles of other species of life. And so, um, uh, so listening becomes critically important in this situation. Um, uh, I think of uh, Michael Stalker, who's a um, director of the Ocean Conservation Research uh, group, uh, a nonprofit organization that studies sound in the ocean and its impacts, especially human generated sounds on uh, whales and cetaceans and other marine life, uh, which is uh, at this time uh, also um, at risk of uh, extinction uh, due to human activities and climate change. And Michael Stalker said, Sound is the physical signature of our dynamic surroundings. Things that move produce it. Things that don't nonetheless impinge on it. For sound to exist, something has to happen. So um, listening and sound are always critically important. So uh, before my time runs out, I'd like to talk a little bit about the World Listening Project and uh, what we do uh, in our, our efforts to promote uh, this awareness of sound, the value of listening, and how uh, the ecology of our planet um, can be best understood through sound and listening. So each year since 2010, we have been um, uh, putting out a call, an invitation for World Listening Day. We're doing it again this year. Uh, we've done it every year since 2010. Uh, this year, uh, World Listening Day it has a theme of the unquiet earth, as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk. We invite a researcher or an artist to, to create the theme. Uh, we have a different theme each year. And this year's theme was created by Raquel Castro, a, a filmmaker, curator, festival organizer based in Lisbon, Portugal. And so um, on the web page here, hopefully you're able to see it. This is the web page for the World Listening Project um, and we communicate our activities here. The Unquiet Earth takes place on the 18th of July. That's on a Sunday. 
anyone can participate. So we're doing this for everyone. It's not just for the people who understand sound. Uh, it's for all of our understanding, appreciation, and participation. So it's a global community event. And I'm inviting you now to, to contact the World Listening Project and get involved and help us um, spread the word, engage people, learn about sound, slow down, and listen. So um, Raquel uh, wrote this statement um, that in 2020, we were forced to pause by an invisible virus. This brought countless consequences to the environment and to the sonic environment in particular. New acoustic horizons emerged, signaling times of unquiet and global change and requiring our listening awareness to evolve. The theme for 2021, the unquiet, unquiet earth is an invitation to reflect on and engage with the constant murmur of the earth sounds beyond the threshold of human hearing to remind ourselves that we share this mysterious and awesome planet, small, hidden, subterranean, aerial, underwater, infra and ultrasonic sounds inaudible to the naked ear can bring a new potentially hopeful perspective on the future of the planet and humanity. Listening as activism encourages us to question our attitudes as listeners, as we aim to construct a more inclusive and empathetic new world, join the revolution. So I hope you will um, share and, and help us grow participation in this global community event by adding your information to the online survey. Uh, you will find it right on our website right here. Um, if I can do my screen share, if it's working, um, this may show up. There's a short online survey. So we're collecting information uh, about participation. And uh, let's see if it'll open up here. Um, um, so you can participate in a, in a very public, organized uh, group activity but participation might be a private activity too. So all levels, uh, the important point is to understand uh, the theme, uh, interpret the theme for World Listening Day and um, uh, appreciate listening and what that means for your world, for your community, for your household, um, for your coworkers. Um, that's the key thing. And so you're invited to submit your um, participation here. And uh, I might also add that uh, we are looking forward to um, producing events within the capacity we have. We're an all volunteer organization with um, a, uh, a very, very small budget. So it's volunteers who make this happen. Um, and uh, at the same time, we hope we can grow the activities and grow the participation. Last year, we had 94 entries in our uh, participation survey. Um, and this year, we, have, we hope that we have uh, 10 times as many, at least. So listening and sound, the ecology of, of our environment through sound is something that affects everyone that lives on the planet. So we hope you will be participating. And with that, I think I will uh, conclude my talk and look forward to answering your questions and discussing the possibilities uh, so that we can best serve our earth, uh, the relationships between artists and scientists, and even the non-specialists, especially, uh, so that we're all participating and making this collective effort uh, to uh, steer ourselves away from extinction. So 
Thank you for listening. Thank you so much for that talk, Eric. Uh, I have a question. Uh, so which part of, I mean, like you have been in this field for a very long time and uh, you definitely would have had like amazing experience working with people from different backgrounds, but which part do you enjoy more? Like being on field or being working with theater people or, you know, just the outreach part of it? Like, I mean, like, what's that, uh, uh, which part that you enjoy more doing? Since you have, yeah. I'm really glad you asked that question because um, um, sometimes uh, I think there's there's two sides to my, the way I work. Um, so, um um, and maybe this is because I was uh, the oldest child in my family and because I was the big brother, I had to watch over my brothers and my sister. And so I like, I like to be able to help students and help people. And so when I know that I'm needed, when my help is needed, I, I, I feel really um, compelled to help people realize what they do. And if I have some special knowledge that I can contribute to help them do what they want to do, like being a musician, you know, and I, I, I like to make, I like to make noises. Um, and I have a, an unusual self-built instrument called the springboard to do that. Um, and, and if people enjoy that and, and, and I can tell they're really listening, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited. And I, I feel like, like a deep sense of, um, of uh, value or the, the I feel the, the, the sense that I'm contributing something to their enjoyment or to their understanding uh, that's valuable for them. So I'm really, um, so I really enjoy that moment, you know, especially when you can make unusual sounds and create a special space like a concert or theater performance where people are going, wow, this is amazing, you know, and if you can be a part of that, not that it's all about what I do, but together, you know, we, we can do it as a, a, a unit. Oftentimes in just uh, freely improvised uh, theater or music situations, it's very exciting. But the other thing I like to do is like, uh, I like to learn how to use technology and just listen and manipulate sound. So I like to go out into the world and just be alone. And I, I like the solitary part too. So that's the social side. There's also the, the side where I like to have time to, to, to reflect and to listen alone without any human uh, relationships. And, and sometimes the technological world, like through computers, I can create a, a digital environment for transforming sounds into new sounds. And so with the technologies, I can make uh, any almost any kind of sound into whatever I imagine. And so that, that creative process is also something that I really enjoy doing. And, and I, 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 I can just do it all day long until I'm sick of being in that environment, then I have to go back out in the world and connect with people. So, so there's just those two parts of me, you know? Yeah, basically you get like all charged and powered up being in solitude and then you kind of just, you know, invest exactly. in connecting with people. Yes, thank you. That's, that's amazing. That's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you get filled up on one way and then you have to go to the other side and right. just kind of process that. And then, and, and then it you go through that process and then you kind of get to a point where you're, enough, you know, and you have to reconnect with the outside world and the, the, uh, the social side. So, and so it's maybe a cycle, a, a dialogue, you know, from one to the other, you know? Right. Um, we would love to just see you like perform, like maybe once sometime in India <laughs> with your instrument. I have not been to Will India. Will that happen? I love, I mean, I've, I've known so many people that have been there and and from everything I hear, it's just like, a, it's such a different place and it's such a fantastic place that I, 
Um, that would be so exciting. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, thank you so much, Eric. And uh, we might have like few questions at the end. We haven't got like any as of now, but we will yeah. go ahead with Claudia's uh, work, and then we can just come back to you for a few more questions. Yeah, I look forward to that. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Hey, Claudia. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so happy for being here. And thank you. And thanks to the other guests. And uh, thank to everybody. <laughs> Well, um, I would like to, uh, and Claudia is someone who is who approached us with this, you know, idea, and uh, she's a musician, a sensorialist, a sound artist, a songwriter, and goes by the artist name, which is very interesting. That's Claudia is on the sofa. Am I correct? Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. And and uh, she's someone who loves to explore sound and studies in all the forms, in all forms. Um, uh, as music, as a physical and a psychological phenomenon, as a form of art and narration as well. And she teaches uh, sensory analysis, analysis uh, and in a university, Catholic University of Sacred Arts and sound storytelling, which is like very, very interesting for me uh, at the University of uh, Pavia. Is that uh, Pavia? Is that how it's pronounced? Pavia. Yes, uh, Pavia. And she is someone who is deeply convinced that attention uh, towards the perception of sound increases the possibility of meeting the beauty of the world, thus recognizes it and spreading it and protecting it. And she has an amazing uh, artwork, like a display or video, which she has done which you'll be showing it to us uh, right now. Thank you so much, Claudia, for joining us. And now you can go ahead and uh, share your work. Thank you, Priyanka. And thank you to everybody. Uh, I'm so happy for being here. Oh, thank you. And uh, just a moment. Uh, here is OK. And uh, we will see um, one of my work today, but um, I, I would like to um, to talk about something that Eric said too, uh, that is the, um, the creative process of the of the sound art and of uh, everything. Because I'm a sound artist, but I'm a songwriter too, and uh, creating a sound art work like. The one you will see and creating a song is more or less the same at first you need uh, to stay alone in the world and to explore it explore your emotion explore um what uh, what uh, people tell to you or people sounds and nature and uh, and the soundscapes are and what are they are and after this, you, uh, you re-elaborate and uh, at the end, you give your work to the people again. And that, that is, this is a really, really important thing to, um, to give what is your work to other people. Because I would like to, to say just one or two things about sound art and, uh, and science uh, and nature. Uh, all um, arts and creative things could be helpful for everyone and for the nature and for ecologic to uh, uh, and for ecologic theme um, because sound art for example can talk about nature and science from its point of view it is a and is an aesthetic point of view but this point of view can connect people intimately with the nature and uh, uh, with ecology if you talk about this in your in your sound at work and uh, and you, 
it is a way to create a, a responsible citizens. So um, with the art, you, you know, with the science research, you are really, really important because you can't improve the knowledge. But if you can give this knowledge to the people with an emotional and easy way, with the sound art, oh, <laughs> this is a really great power that you can have. And uh, you can talk to everyone and um, you can create um, and you can raise awareness uh, and protection of the nature. And you can do this in uh, different ways. Uh, in, the, um, in Point of No Return, that is uh, the sound art work that you will see, um, I had a really, really uh, artistic uh, approach. But, for example, you can create a um, direct interaction with the scientific data. And, uh, for example, I would like to talk to you about um, a new uh, sound art work I'm, uh, I'm, I created with a scientist and artist team. And this uh, sonification of a um, data set uh, coming from a very large telescope placed in a Chile desert. So a scientist from uh, uh, the study of the universe and a sound artist and, uh, from university too, uh, work it together and we create um, a signification of data of galaxies. So you can see that uh, um, you can um, you can let people see what uh, usually cannot see because we we don't have access to this scientist data set data set. And so, uh this this opera is called uh, uh, sonic cosmos <laughs> and uh, today i will present you point of no return and uh, is a sound art work created in uh, uh, 2019 and uh, before the pandemic shows us uh, more clearly the effects of the human activities on the ecosystem this point of no return uh, talk about uh, uh, the climate change. And so, at the, um, it, it is a travel from today, the point of no return of climate change, and move backwards to the region of the man and the, and the universe. And at the beginning, you will hear oh, <laughs> lots of sounds. And uh, they are sounds of everyday life. You can hear some uh, human sounds, some nature sounds. And um, you will have uh, something like a storytelling that brings you from an um, anthropic world to a natural world. But it's just a joke. What I made is just to have a lot of layers of sounds and I, I can sell them, I stop one by one, all of these layers. So at the end, you have just uh, two sounds. One sound, sound is high and the other sound is low. And it's what you can hear in an anechoic chamber. And uh, in this anechoic chamber that is a room with no sounds, is really isolated, acoustic isolated uh, room, you can hear just your um, nervous system and your blood system. And so uh, what does it mean? It means that um, if and if there are lots of sounds, lots of uh, meanings, lots of uh, thoughts. If you can, uh, if you play attention and you go slow and you listen and you hear, you can hear 
what you are. You can hear the nature. You can hear your blood and the nervous system, the nature and the origin. You just need to slow down. They are always present. <laughs> so maybe this work will talk better than me <laughs> about this. So I will, uh, I will make it, I will play it.
So <clears throat> that was point of no return. So at the beginning, you heard "I forgive you," and that's what nature and heart and humanity say to everybody. So we can listen, and uh, we can listen to what is really deep inside us and really deep inside nature. And uh, thank you for the comments, I, I'm reading it. And uh, thank you so much. So uh, we, if you have any question or... <laughs> Hi. Hey, Claudia, that was amazing. You know, it was so transcending. Like, I mean, I'm so glad that I had not, I heard it only once when you had sent it. <laughs> but today I was just sitting here and it was like a very different feeling, you know. Uh, yeah. Maybe, I, I mean, I would definitely appreciate it the same way every time I see it. I mean, hear it again and again. But <laughs> sitting here was, uh, I mean, that that was that was super cool, man. Thank you so much for doing oh, that. Thank you. Thank and, you. Uh, and I want to thank I, Maurizio Rinaldi that made uh, the um, sphere, <laughs> okay, the video. And it's a really nice uh, video with a slow motion of this sphere that is uh, maybe it's the heart, maybe, maybe it's us. It depends <laughs> what you prefer. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, uh, so we have like, I mean, very good, like comments, uh, it was very soothing, but sometimes a car hum kind of just brings you back to the earth, even though you kind of just transcend to <laughs> the different world with your music. But at one point of time, all those, you know, the car hums cannot just bring you back. You know, it feels <laughs> like you're not in a different world anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. So we will take a few questions at the end, uh, Claudia, and now we will, uh, go to, which is uh, talk. So see you later. Thank yes. you. Yes. <laughs> hey Priyanka. Hey Vijay. Oh, you're here. Okay. I hope your internet. Vijay is actually connecting uh, us from, like, you know, somewhere from the corner of the Western Guards. So I hope his internet connection just works very well for us. Uh, so let me just uh, introduce you to Vijay. Uh, Vijay Ramesh is, he calls himself an avian ecologist, uh, who but he has a broad interest, uh, including bioacoustics and historical ecology. Um, specifically, he prefers, he uses acoustic data to monitor diversity across the tropical forests of Western Ghats. He's currently pursuing his uh, PhD in Columbia University where he co-founded Project Dwani along with Pooja and Sarika, um, an initiative that uses acoustic to capture vocalizing biodiversity across Central India and the Western Ghats. So Vijay is here to talk about his work and just, you know, uh, 
I mean, I hope he just shows us or like you know displays some of. Uh, we get to hear like all those like bird calls and the landscape uh, uh, sonics that he has recorded uh, during the process. Thank you so much, Vijay, for joining us, and it's a pleasure to have you, man. Now it's all yours. Thanks, Priyanka. Let me share my screen. Let's hope this works. Share audio, yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, can you all see this? Priyanka is working. Yes, yes, it is. Okay, great, great. Uh, it would be great if, uh, uh, firstly, thanks, Claudia and Eric, for those wonderful presentations. I hope uh, you can all hear the audio I'm going to play in a bit. And, and uh, thank you so much to everyone for tuning in this late. Uh, I'm Vijay Ramesh, a PhD student at uh, Columbia University, and my broad interests range from acoustics to natural history and uh, historical ecology. So uh, today I'm going to be talking about a small project that I've been working on for the past few years, and an initiative that uh, resulted from uh, as this project is part of this broader initiative, Project Dwani. Dwani is the Sanskrit word for sound, and uh, sound is what our project is all about. And our aim is to essentially monitor biodiversity across human modified landscapes of India, specifically in Central India and the Western Ghats. So before I tell you a bit more about the project that I've been working on, I am going to take you, uh, transport you to some of the forests of uh, Southern India. And uh, I just want you all to make a note of the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear these clips. So I'm going to play two clips for you today. And uh, maybe you can just uh, add your comments in the comment box and tell me what you think about these clips. Or what, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Right. So here's the first clip. Let's go. I hope this works. Okay, so that's the first clip. I hope you guys were able to hear that. This is the second clip I'm going to play for you. This clip's a bit feeble. Um, okay. I'm going to stop and uh, maybe hear from all of you in terms of what you guys thought about the first two clips. Or what's the first thing that came to your mind when you heard these two clips, if you were able to hear it? Um, please don't be shy. Uh, feel free to type in whatever thoughts you had about these sounds. Are there any comments, Priyanka? Yes, I'm displaying it. I think you can see it on your screen. Um, oh, okay. I think my screen is shared, so I'm unable to see the comments. I think uh, if you want to read it out, are saying please. it's Drongo. It's Drongo. Okay. okay. And uh, Aditi is saying it might be a, a racket and a puff. Is that a, a is that an avian terminology? I don't know. <laughs> uh, Great. I mean, I wasn't looking for specific avian uh, identifications of what was heard in these calls, but uh, they are on point. You definitely heard a greater racket tail drongo and uh, probably the buff throated yes. babbler. Yeah. Uh, buff throated babbler also in there. But I think the point I wanted to drive across here is that uh, the first uh, clip actually came from a protected area forest site in the southern Western Ghats. I'll tell you a bit more about the Western Ghats in a bit. And uh, you, you have a sense of uh, how distinct the soundscape is for a habitat that is uh, uh, extremely dense, the understory or, or you know, the, the forest that you can see in the picture that I've shown you here is, is pretty uh, dense and there aren't too many gaps in the forest, so to say. And uh, 
The clip that I played for you, I have just visualized the same clip as a spectrogram. So a spectrogram is nothing but uh, visualizing sound in uh, two-dimensional space. So you can see time on the x-axis and frequency on the y-axis. And you can actually see the racket tail Drongo's calls in, in between the second second and the fourth second, right? You have visuals of what's happening in this particular habitat. And uh, the second clip that I pay, played for you actually came from the exact same region, but it was from a distinct habitat. So you can actually see a lot of eucalyptus in the foreground. So it's a timber plantation, so not a forest per se. And uh, as a result of the habitat being slightly distinct, the soundscape is also pretty distinct, right? So you can, you can see that this spectrogram is pretty empty, so to say. So there weren't too many birds vocalizing or too many insects vocalizing as well. And we'll keep coming back to this uh, broader message that I want to drive across uh, in a bit. And uh, let me tell you a bit more about the project that I've been working on for the last few years. So in uh, 2017, I was uh, in the uh, forests of South India. And uh, here you can see my colleague uh, carrying out a point count, which is a standardized way of uh, recording all the birds uh, and biodiversity that you hear and see around you, right? And uh, usually when one does this, you know, you're just sitting in a particular, sitting or standing in a particular place, or you're walking a particular distance and recording on the biodiversity. But when, when you're in a tropical forest, the first thing that you notice is that a vast majority of the biodiversity is heard, but never really seen. And uh, uh, some of the estimates that we have been looking at suggest that over 90% of the birds that uh, we have been uh, uh, recording in our, uh, in our data is often, I mean, 90% of the birds that we've been seeing in this forest is often just heard rather than seen. Right? So, that got me thinking and I was wondering, what if we use a slightly different tool to uh, actually record all the biodiversity that we want to record? And that's where an acoustic recorder, an audio recorder came into play. And uh, an audio recorder can actually reduce a ton of manual effort, but also increase our uh, uh, survey effort as we can place these tiny devices across different forests and record thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of data. Right. Uh, you can ask me, Vijay, so what? What's what's the big deal, right? Uh, well, the big deal here is that uh, today we are facing a really huge crisis of habitat loss, right? So habitat loss is one of the, the most pervasive drivers of biodiversity loss. And we need a tool like acoustics or uh, satellite images that can help us rapidly monitor the effects of deforestation and thereby aid conservation. And here I want to make the case for acoustics as a broad conservation tool. In fact, uh, there's been some work that, have, that has been carried out in the wonderful forests of Borneo, where uh, uh, scientists essentially place recorders in forests that were logged, as well as forests that were uh, uh, in a, a forest that were uh, not logged, right? So, just to ask if the soundscape, so to say, is distinct across these two uh, regions, right? And uh, they, in fact, showed us that, you know, the forests that were locked seem to have lost quite a bit of biodiversity. And uh, one can even answer other questions such as, you know, how does logging impact or, you know, uh, deforestation impact biodiversity over time? Imagine placing these recorders in these forest patches year after year after year, and getting a sense of what's happening to the overall biodiversity in that particular location, right? And what if I were to take that and even compare it across a regional baseline? Let's say we compare it across uh, broad geographic areas, right? Uh, that can give us a really good sense of what's happening across distinct forest types, as well as uh, 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 different biodiversity as well that reside in these forests. And uh, lastly, while habitat loss is a pervasive driver, we are forgetting the effects of climate change, which we are currently uh, uh, facing. And uh, it might be interesting to use acoustics as a rapid uh, monitoring tool to inform the effects of climate change on biodiversity. So keeping all this in mind, we decided to start Project Dwani in, uh, in India. And uh, our aim was to essentially uh, record 
uh, and well, our initial aim was to record biodiversity across distinct forest types, but we wanted to monitor biodiversity across the forests of Central India and the Western Ghats. But more importantly, we wanted to look at the human modified landscapes of the Western Ghats and uh, Central India. Uh, if you want to know more, please click on this link and uh, uh, listen and learn a bit more about what we've been working on for the last few years now. So today I'm going to be going to the forests of the Western Ghats. And yes, I'll tell you a bit more about the Western Ghats now. So we primarily work, as I mentioned earlier, in the forests of the Western Ghats in Central India. And uh, specifically, I have been carrying out some acoustic monitoring in the Anamalai Hills of the Southern Western Ghats. The Western Ghats is this long mountain chain that runs along the southwestern coast of India and is home to extraordinary levels of biodiversity. At the same time, it's home to large human populations. And these are regions that have undergone, you know, uh, drastic uh, anthropogenic changes. So here's just a cursory figure that shows you how a particular landscape or a land cover type has changed over time. In fact, uh, the panel on the top shows you the Nilgiri Hills and the panel at the bottom shows you the Anamala Hills. And one can clearly see that the overall proportion of say timber plantations as well as uh, tea has increased since 1973, right? And uh, so there's a lot of uh, changes that are occurring in these landscapes, which I would like to term as broadly anthropogenic changes. And so that got me thinking, what if I were to uh, look at how these anthropogenic changes or these distinct habitat types are influencing the way biodiversity uses these habitat types? Right? And uh, birds seem to be an ideal model because uh, birds, as you all know, vocalize. And uh, that gives us a clear sense of uh, which species is present where, uh, while some species definitely don't vocalize, a vast majority of birds vocalize, songbirds in particular. right? And uh, this, this landscape is unique because you know you have this gradient of land cover types. So here's a picture from uh, one of our sites. You can see the protected area on the background, a small forest fragment in the, in the middle, and a tea plantation uh, patch, mosaics of tea are joining the forest fragments, right? So it's this, it's this really wonderful gradient of forests and tea and forests and tea, and of course, uh, uh, settlements as well. And uh, here you can see this uh, uh, forest, which is basically sitting in an island of tea plantations surrounding it. Right? And uh, these, these forests are also home to large biodiversity. These forests are well, large, uh, no pun intended, but these forests are really home to these huge, uh, gentle giants like elephants, which essentially use tea to cross, uh, one, uh, to go from one forest fragment to another. And uh, I was really fortunate to actually see this from up close, you know. Um, and you can see that, you know, these these elephants are just literally go from, you know, one small forest fragment to the adjoining forest fragment, but they'll have to go through T to do the same. But it's not just elephants. We also have one of my favorite model taxa, birds, that uh, inhabit a wide range of habitat types and are present uh, in this particular landscape. So the Anamalai Hills in particular, we have the Valparai Plateau. And uh, so it's a plateau that is at, at about 1,300 meters in elevation above sea level. And in this particular plateau, uh, scientists at the Nature Conservation Foundation, a nonprofit, have been uh, restoring degraded forest patches for the last 20 years. So here's an image of a forest patch uh, that was taken in uh, 2008. And uh, here's an image that was taken last year. You can see a stark difference when uh, the forests are being actively restored. Right? So that got me thinking, what if I were to look at, you know, these actively restored forests, these uh, passively restored forests, in other words, just abandoned forest fragments where there hasn't been any restoration carried out, and then you have these protected area forests. Uh, and the broad question was, how does the species, uh, you know, uh, is there a difference in the number of bird species that we see as we go from actively restored forests to these protected area sites? 
And uh, as I was really interested in using acoustics, another question is there a difference in the soundscape across restored forests versus passively restored forests and your benchmark protected area sites? And uh, how do we go about doing this? Well, we place these uh, wonderful audio devices. Uh, here's an image of uh, two distinct audio devices that we use. One is uh, an audio moth on your right and a swift record on the left. Uh, today, we've been using mostly these audio moth recorders, which, which are small enough, but yet efficient and can be uh, used to record biodiversity across uh, large areas. and. Uh, it can help us cover a number of locations, unique locations across this region. Right? So I'm going to show you a bit of a, a sneak peek of our analysis, just show you some results from the initial data that we have been collecting over the last year. So we have about 43 locations, unique locations in the Anamala Hills, and we've been using these audio moth recorders. And uh, we've been collecting data at each of these sites for about a week, 15 days at a stretch. So we have a ton of data that's coming from each of these sites. And uh, uh, my colleague Akshay Anand here has been um, uh, actually going through all this data and uh, annotating what birds that he can hear in each of these uh, recordings. Right. So uh, I just wanted to credit Akshay here for carrying out this work here, results of which I'll show you in a second. And uh, We've been essentially placing recorders across different seasons, as uh, many ecologists here who are in this presentation know that uh, uh, the birds, uh, there are a lot of migratory birds that would come in the winter from their really harsh uh, wintering grounds to uh, the South India to spend their winters here. And of course, in the summer, they would return to their breeding, and not so harsh wintering grounds anymore. So here yeah, I'm going to just show you some uh, analysis that we've been carrying out for data that we recorded last summer. Uh, just two, these are the, I apologize for these two heavy data slides. These are the only two heavy data slides I have in the entire presentation, but uh, just bear with me here. So uh, what Akshay did here is uh, we wanted to estimate the number of detections of a particular bird species across each of our different uh, treatment types or restoration types. Have your actively restored forests on the x-axis and then your benchmark protected area forests and your passively restored forests. And on the y-axis, you have the overall number of detections of a particular bird species. And uh, we are seeing some encouraging results here in that uh, a lot of rainforest specialists uh, at as expected, were more often detected in your benchmark protected area sites, right? But following that, uh, we actually are recording quite a high number of uh, rainforest specialists in our actively restored sites uh, relative to your passively restored, you know, degraded forest fragments where there isn't much restoration being carried out. On the other hand, if you look at open country birds, uh, Open country birds often being uh, birds like red whiskered bulbul or common tailor birds that uh, we often consider as generalist species because they, they, they occur across a wide range of habitats ex except your uh, uh, rainforests and uh, other forest pristine habitats. And as expected, uh, across our passively restored or degraded fragments, we had a higher number of uh, you know uh, open country birds relative to our actively restored and our benchmark sites. So this is an, indeed an encouraging result that suggests that active restoration can really help bring back biodiversity to some of these formerly degraded forest fragments. Um, we then decided to take it a step further. We wanted to see what does the overall soundscape look like. So I'm just going to show you the soundscape for one particular uh, uh, site. And uh, this site is actually a protected area site just to show you how distinct uh, the overall use of acoustic space is within a given 24 hour period. So here, I would like to turn this graph as an acoustic space use graph. On the x-axis in the bottom, you have time of day in hours. And you, you, I'm going from midnight on the left to midnight on the right. So it's, it's an entire day. On the y-axis is frequency in kilohertz. And each particular box here 
represents the uh, overall amount of acoustic activity within that given frequency bin right and uh, so i want to point out certain interesting uh, patterns which is intuitive to uh, uh, someone who would be going into a forest right so as expected there's quite a bit of bird activity at dawn starting at 6 am and a majority is bird activity restricted to these uh, lower frequencies slightly lower frequencies uh, until about 10000 to 12000 kilohertz right and it's really interesting that this bird activity tends to taper off towards uh, towards the end of dusk which is about 6 pm again in the evening and uh, you also have a ton of insect activity that's occurring at higher frequencies uh, in earlier in the day like you know in midnight from 1 am to about 5 am and then again starting at about 11 p 11 am to 4 pm and then again at night night again right and uh, the the point i wanted to drive across here is that uh, it's it's really fascinating to see how different biodiversity tend to partition the frequency space that they occupy right so you have these birds that are vocalizing at lower frequencies and insects vocalizing at higher frequencies so the next step for us is to actually think about are we missing or you know are there certain uh, uh, bins in this frequency space that are not occupied as you go from a protected area site to a degraded forest the expectation is that you know we're probably losing some biodiversity as we go from a protected area site to a degraded forest and that's something that we're currently working on and we hope to uh, analyze that data soon but there's some some more cooler patterns that we're seeing which we are uh, exploring at the moment for example if you look at uh, frequency space between 5 am to 6 am and again 6 pm 7 pm um, these are what i would like to term as transition times so in fact uh, as you hear the recordings you notice that uh, insects are really loud from 1 am to 5 am and then at 5 am there's just lull in activity there's just no activity at all the entire forest tends to be it just sounds so quiet and then again you have this a uh, burst of bird activity that starts at 6 am and then it goes on until 10 am and then you know there's a bit of a lull in activity in terms of bird activity and then the insects pick up again at higher frequencies and then come again towards 6 pm or you know a little later when the dusk activity slowly recedes a uh, dusk activity for birds and you again have this sort of lull in you know activity sort of a transition from uh well from you know uh, day to night so to say and it's it's really really beautiful to see these patterns actually in uh, frequency space um but that being said uh, the next step is to probably in fact uh, get detailed habitat measurements uh, we've been recording some habitat measurements from the our sites in central india as well as the western ghats and uh, we want to ask how does habitat quality among other things really influence the overall acoustic activity with that i want to tell you a bit more about project me and our long term conservation goals so uh, as uh, you already heard our one of our goals is to monitor biodiversity across these human modified landscapes of india but we've also been uh, trying to test the feasibility of an automated detection system of uh, what we would like to call illegal activity across some of these protected areas sites there can be quite a bit of uh, poaching and logging in some of these sites and we would like to use some of the sounds that we record in a artificial intelligence or a deep learning framework to help us uh, understand uh, or you know help us create some sort of an early warning system that uh, stakeholders like the forest department can use to prevent any events of poaching right um, but uh, in the short run we've been thinking about looking at species specific identification so since we've been collecting a ton of data and this data is being annotated to identify distinct avian species uh we would like to provide the same to an artificial intelligence framework and ask uh, which species is being detected if unseen data is provided to this framework and lastly uh, we would like to uh, you know engage a broader community with uh, the idea of using acoustics for conservation and uh, uh, as a educator broader general audience about uh, why using sounds as eric and claudia pointed out could be a potentially uh, 
useful as well as a scientific tool for uh, conserving biodiversity in the long run as well as the short run. With that, I would like to thank the entire team at Project Vani. We have a number of people working with us and we're really thankful for uh, all the efforts that all of you have been putting in. You know, you guys know who you are. Uh, Forest Departments of Tamil Nadu and Madhya Pradesh, our collaborators, Nature Conservation Foundation, Foundation for Ecological Society, and Isa Tirupati, and most importantly, the communities around uh, the tiger reserves of uh, Anamalais and Kanha National Park for uh, providing us an opportunity to actually go into these forests and work here. And uh, my advisor, Ruth DeFries and Columbia University, and uh, our funders, uh, thank you so much for giving us the funds to work on these projects. And lastly, thank you, Priyanka, for inviting me for this wonderful uh, uh, discussion and this evening of soundscapes. With that, I'm happy to take any questions that any of you have. Thank you. Thank you so much, man. That was uh, interesting, you know, uh, knowing that, you know, this kind of work is happening in India also. Is, uh, it just makes me happy. <laughs> you know, as if somebody is just working on these aspects, right? Um, so questions might just come in, but I do have like few questions for you folks. Uh, so since you guys have been working in this field, I know Vijay has been working in field, like in lab, and there's a lot of things that he pursue. But right now he's someone who has been working with the sounds. But how do you guys just, uh, uh, you know, like what sound to you is? You know, like, I mean, how do you connect it? You know, for you, like when, when somebody says sound, like what just, how do you connect to it? Um, do one of you want to take this first? I think for me, um, I, I, I have my, my experience of music. And so um, uh, maybe it's something I had to learn over time, but now I can relate to sounds um, and through listening to, uh, believe it or not, electronic music, um, because I mentioned working in the digital environment where I can um, speak into the microphone and then transform the, the recorded sound into something completely different, you know, stretch the time, shift the pitch up um, or shrink it down um, and, and, uh, or put it through filters or change the envelope and all of these um, physical properties of the sound transformed into the digital domain you know, give access to this sort of, you might say the internal structure of the sound and then you can pull it apart and make it into something else. So having that point of reference um, to in, in that relationship or that capacity, all of those things, um, I, I listen to all the sounds around me and, and I think I have a particular way because of that electronic music experience to um, hear uh, the sounds of, of bird calls, the, the insects and their vocalizations or um, and that. And, and I have a, just like a, I can relate it to that. It's like, and so I can, I can reference it. Uh, it's just like, well, that's a very high frequency sound, um, but it has an interesting pitch contour to it. And, um, and at the same time, I can reference it in terms of like, I've never heard a bird like that in my my neighborhood or, um, or that's like one that I know, but different. And how is it different? So I can just go through all of that in my own uh, experience and my own memory and call that forth or be surprised by something that is completely unusual. It's like, is that an animal? Is that a machine? I can't tell the difference. And that becomes a, mis a mystery. And I'm drawn to the mysterious sounds or, you know, I referenced John Cage at the beginning of my talk and um, um, Cage said something about, 
um, um, most of the time, I can't remember the quote exactly, but most of the time when we listen to sounds, we're just noticing noise, uh, except for the quiet, the small sounds, and, and uh, we might be drawn to the, the little ones that are almost at the threshold of hearing going, what is that? You know, so it's not the loud things, but it's the very quiet things that are just almost not there that are kind of attract our attention sometimes. So, Claudia, for you, sound is. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Eric. And uh, <clears throat> my first approach, deep approach with the sound, uh, came from um, my personal approach with with the voice because I'm a singer and when I discover that I can change my sound in my body because we have resonator our body is an instrument and you can move the air in different places and change the sound and change the vibration that you can perceive on your body because it's really connected sound and touch and so this, um, this connection with the voice um, make me, um, interested me in all the sounds. And uh, I, I really love the, the work that, uh, <clears throat> that uh, you're having in the forest because uh, all the animal and nature have their own voices. And if you can uh, notice it, uh, every animal has a frequencies and, uh, and they can uh, find their own uh, uh, space into the whole frequencies to recognize each other. We are all screaming our, oh, I'm here. Oh, I love you. Oh, I'm scared. Oh, <laughs> I'm just here. And I want to tell you that I'm here. Or maybe we are just singing and we have all our sounds. And all of this is in a, in a complex soundscape with the nature sounds, for example, rain or waves or anything else. And human sounds that are not just, um, you know, the technological sounds, uh, uh, I, I like to, to think about human and nature as a, just one thing. And so, uh, as Eric told uh, before, we are sound and nature with ourselves, even when we are recording, even we, when we are in a place. We are part of the soundscape with our footstep or our breath. Even if we are really, really quiet, you know, all uh, <laughs> most of you maybe know that. Uh, oh, now I stay here and quiet, and I try to to, to have the, to record the sound of this bird. Maybe an hour, two hour, and after this, oh yes, now he's singing, <laughs> and he's making what you what what I do with my voice. I, I we we move our air into our body so that's how i how, how i live sound <laughs> yeah i think for me growing up in bangalore my association uh, has been just you know the sounds of a concrete jungle but uh, as you start working in some of these forests of the western Ghats, the the cacophony of the dawn chorus is something that just fascinates me but, uh, you know, I think as I move from some of these, as I mentioned, you know, these protected area sites to some of these uh, actively restored sites that are, res you know, in between uh, tea plantations. And you can hear these sounds of uh, sirens of the tea and people talking, etc. So I think it's, uh, to me today, I think about it as, uh, uh, you know, biodiversity adapting to the urban noise and urban activity and uh, seeing it more from a very uh, scientific perspective as to how biodiversity is going to adapt to the the noise pollution that we are sort of creating apart from destroying the habitat but, yeah right i mean the reason why i asked the question is because 
I mean, like according to Eric, like sound is a reference, and for Claudia, it's presence and connection. For you, it's all about science and like connecting and and looking at the biodiversity part of it. So, if you guys can just pursue, I mean, it's sound is just one word, but you individually have like a way of like pursuing it, and that's what I want. We wanted people to realize today, at least, that especially when you are in the forest. It's not just what you see; it's just sounds also that just matters, and they. I, I mean that there's a way that you can connect, and that's an that's a that's an entirely a different language in which uh, uh, animals or diversity kind of like communicates, right? So that's why I asked that uh, question too, and then follow up with that uh, is that. Uh, for you guys have been, especially Eric has been working uh, with uh, soundscapes like for a very long time now. Um, I mean, I, I think I asked this uh, question uh, already. He, he most Eric, like, is is there anything that that current generation like you think it's it's gonna like a message um, when it comes to the soundscape part because this is something that not many people are aware of or like even uh, know of. Um, so like if somebody wants to pursue it or like if somebody is interested in it, um, uh, where do you think they can start off from? With, um, just to clarify your question in, to, to start off with listening or to be involved in a group that is, um, creating or researching because there's, there's anything, so many anything. levels. Yeah. Levels of it, yes. Yeah, you know, like, it, it, you know, right this moment, we could just all close our eyes and be quiet. And we were like, for 30 seconds. Right. We'll, we'll do it. We'll just, no, no sound. 30 seconds, we'll just close your eyes and listen. So that's about 10 seconds if you keep your eyes closed. Maybe take a deep breath and slowly breathe in. And then slowly let your breath out. And then listen for the sound that's closest to you. And the sound that's the most distant. In almost every moment, there's a new one that's coming in as another one's going away. Maybe there's one sound that's there all the time. I can hear the fan of my computer going because <laughs> it's getting hot. So anyways, that's an example. You just start. Just close your eyes and, and be quiet. And breathe, and and th and then you become aware. There's there's things happening all the time, and that's part of the place you're in. And you know you could say it's that that is that's its voice. And then as a uh, as a scientist or as a uh, a creative uh, artist or sound designer, you you do the same thing. But it it also it, it may not be that simple because uh, I've also been uh, talking with researchers who want to uh, explore quiet places, you know, for health and relaxation. I'm thinking of um, Antonella Radici, uh, based in uh, Berlin, and she has the um, uh, the Hush City um, uh, mobile app, so you can go to places and find quiet places in the city and then map them and analyze them and things. But in that conversation, we realized that finding a quiet place can be, uh, especially in the city, it can be a real luxury for some. And, and uh, those who are wealthy might have the privilege to have a, a quiet place to be in where others don't have that choice. And, being, and, and taking time to listen might be very difficult and it could be socially uh, uncomfortable and it could make you feel vulnerable. So we always have to be aware that uh, our different ways of listening uh, are, are different for our circumstances. 
our age. Um, you know, a child or a teenager might ha have a very different real relationship with with sound and the making of sound and the need to make it. It might be a defensive mechanism or response. Uh, so, at the same time, uh, I think in in the at least the the American European civilization and it, it, the drive to make money uh, forces us to be rushing and, and speeding through and uh, there's never enough time because time is always money. And when you wanna listen, we wanna stop and slow down. So we're kind of, we're fighting against the pressure to be successful, you know? And, and we, so we're creating, um, well, Hildegard Westerkamp, I mentioned her in my talk, uh, she's given talks on the disruptive nature of listening. Uh, so it, it can be a disruption too. So we have to take care and be considerate of what we're, what we're asking each other to do. And I think uh, Vijay might be able to speak to like what happens when we're studying the, the, the soundscape and, and this analysis and the data showing us that um, farming and agriculture is having a negative impact on the rainforest ecology. Uh, you have to clear forests, you know, where, where many rainforests are being just cut and it's changing our soundscape um, in, 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 in radical ways. But if you ask people, well, no, you can't farm here, that is a problem because that's the survival of people and industries and things. So you're calling that into question. So we have we have some challenges in, in to find a balance. It's it's not an easy thing, but at least we can close our eyes and take a deep breath. <laughs> so uh, I hope. All right, I've said too much, but <laughs> right. Thanks, thanks, Eric. Uh, Vijay, you have a question uh, from uh, Kartika Menon. Can you read it? Uh, is it's displayed, or you want me to? Sure, I can, I can, yeah, I can read it. Uh, with uh, respect to the pandemic and assuming decreased traffic or human produced noise, was there any noticeable impact on the soundscape? Yeah, that's a great question. In fact, uh, that's something uh, we've been thinking about right now and we are currently pursuing that. And we were essentially recording data in some of these uh, locations where we collected acoustic data during the pandemic and before the pandemic. And now we're gonna be collecting some data, I mean, I shouldn't say post pandemic, but hopefully soon. Uh, but uh, since there isn't a lockdown anymore, we're going to collect some of some data in some of these sites and uh, uh, essentially ask if, yeah, exactly the what the question phrased, you know, if uh, decreased human uh, activity resulted in uh, increased vocalizations in terms of biodiversity. Uh, in fact, there was a very cool paper related to sparrows from. Uh, I think it's uh, somewhere in California, I'm not sure where exactly, but uh, in the journal Science, where they actually showed the impacts of uh, COVID-19 on uh, increased uh, vocalization activity of these birds in uh, Western United States. Uh, but it remains to be seen if that's the case for a tropical country like India. Thanks, Vijay. Uh, Claudia, I have a, a question for you. So, the uh, I mean, since you are like an like a sound artist, and uh, how do you how do you pursue? Uh, I mean, you have actually like displayed, like worked on it, and you showed your work and how you connect to it. But uh, which is that one work uh, which is very close to you? Uh, uh, you have worked on so far. Uh, especially connecting with in with related to nature so which which uh, <clears throat> which work. work sound at work in particular is, is really connected with me yes and nature which you like and nature yes oh, oh. Uh, <laughs> the one i show you is one is uh, one of the first that I sh show to people, and it um, it make me know that I can do something with the people to change their way to think about nature and ecology. You know, um, 
here in Italy, we have a really, really anthropic ambient. Um, not big town, but oh, in every in every place you can find a little village. You can find him, uh, someone, and uh, really, really wild nature is not so <laughs> so common here. Mm? Uh, there is something in the Alps, uh, and um, and and so we are not used to, and it's not simple to go into the wild here. Mm? <laughs> and so uh, to create um, something to let people uh, uh, image or just think about this or just have the curiosity to go to another place or to to stay in their place and do what we did a few minutes ago. Just close the eyes and hear and listen. And and they, it changes the way to think of the people. I, I do some uh, sound walks with people here in Italy too. And uh, and uh, when they and, and we go in a place and we, we have some exercise uh, of listening and we go quiet and slow and people are uh, are always so happy to be quiet and slow. And they they told me that they have a lot of word to to recognize and to identify, for example, the different kind of a uh, notification of the smartphone. Hmm? But we don't have the words to identify birds, for example, or nature sounds. We can understand that yes, it's nature, maybe it's some animal, but we don't uh, we don't know which kind of animal because our kind of life was changed. So we we need <laughs> lots of words for the notification, and we don't need uh, lots of words of bird. <laughs> what is this? A bird? <laughs> no, it's not enough. So we can we. It's really important here to starting doing this, and um, and there's a thing that uh, I would like to, to say that um, is that, for example, in a um, in a study that uh, uh, David Monaki did, uh, he he went to the rainforest and uh, he recorded uh, hours and hours of uh, sounds. And he discovered that um, some animals close to the, um, the oil extraction plants became quiet because this low sound was too high. And so even if they talk each other, they didn't, they cannot hear them, each other. <laughs> so they became quiet. They became uh, with no voice, and that's uh, what we we in a, that the danger for the humans too. Because if there are lots of sounds, we become quiet too. So we need to listen to listen the nature and to listen the humans too. And that's uh, that's what I like to do with the people. Mm, yes. <laughs> Thanks, thanks, Claudia. So I think I think we have to wind up because uh, because in India it's already nine thirty, <laughs> and I, I really appreciate like all those people who have tuned in so late. And uh, thank you so much for I mean like Eric and joining us like like from US, which is like early morning for you, uh, and like Claudia from Italy and Vijay from somewhere from corner of like Western Ghats where you hardly have connection. But you somehow managed to pull it off for the entire session. Thank you so much, Vijay. And um, the idea of like bringing all of you together because you come from a different background and you have your own expertise that we want people to know that, you know, um, forests can be perceived and can be appreciated from not just by looking at it, by hearing it as well. And every the acoustics um, have an impact. I mean, we might we might just consider, I mean, you might just take things for granted, but the the example which Claudia gave and the research what Vijay is doing and what 
Any count just reiterated again and again. The 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 sound also matters a lot, and it's it's uh, the healthy sound means that you have a healthy voice, right? So that's what we need. We wanted to put it across, and you guys just uh, made it happen uh, for us today. Thank you so much for joining us, guys, and I really appreciate uh, uh, that you have spent your time and uh, I mean just uh, talking about your work and uh, just being with us. Uh, we were so happy to have you on board. Thank you. Thank you. For Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you everyone for listening. <laughs> Thank you everybody.